How's it going guys? Today, a little bit of a treat for you. So we are not in Benson, Arizona. Doesn't exactly look like it. Um, we are in Tempe, Arizona, which is a suburb of Phoenix. And Hannah and I, we came up here, we're looking for our buddy, his name is Jake Mace, otherwise known as the vegan athlete on YouTube. And apparently he has the most incredible garden, most incredible edible food forest in the Phoenix area. So we're gonna try to find his place and uh, we'll get a little bit of an interview with him. I think it'll be pretty cool. That's not his house. Mm, that's not his house. That's not his house there. I have no idea where it could be. If that came across as totally cheesy, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, this is, his, uh, this is his front yard here. So Jake has an amazing garden. Let's go in, we'll get a bit of a tour, um, because I've had the comment from a few people that, you know, how are you gonna grow stuff in a desert climate? Well, Jake has just an absolutely incredible food forest right here in Phoenix, Arizona, or Tempe, Arizona, in a desert climate. Let's check it out. What's up? How's it going, man? How you doing? Good. Thanks for coming to, Good my, to see you. my longevity gardens. Tell I had a gardening friend years ago told me I had to name my property, so I figured I'd call it longevity gardens because the goal in the martial arts or in meditation or in fitness or in veganism is to have longevity. Okay. Nice. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so you have an edible food forest here. How, about how many fruit trees do you have? There's like 30 in the front yard. There's like 180 in the backyard. Jesus. But, I mean, we're just in the beginning stages. I mean, this place has only been um, growing food for like five years. So five years ago, it was just a dirt lot with nothing here. And uh, we have grown pretty intensively in that five year period. So uh, we have a lot of trees, but a lot of them are babies and they grow bigger every year. The reason why I started this place, if you guys want to know, is that I was vegan. I've been vegan 16 years. And when I bought this place, um, it was like my 11 year anniversary being vegan. So I figured I need to plant something to eat to lower my food bill. So I started with like a fig tree, pomegranate tree, citrus tree, peach tree, and I kind of became edible fruit tree hoarders after that. Yeah, and now people come and visit you, like us, just to check it out. You know, I'm a martial artist, but now people know me as a gardener, so I guess that's what I've become, is like a almost full hippie gardener. Well, I think it's really amazing, because a lot of people don't think that you can grow a lot of stuff in the desert, and I think you've kind of uh, blown that myth out of the water. You know. I've been here a while, so I'm 35, I've been here since I was 12 in the Phoenix area. And you just have to change, you have to keep the gardening bug and keep the gardening enthusiasm, but just change your approach a little bit. Mm. And I'll show you some of the secrets today as we walk around, but awesome. um, I'm telling you, what is your opinion of my yard compared to my neighbor's yard? It's crazy. Well, that's what, what I show, that's what I showed them right at the start. I'm like, where's Jake's house? Is that Jake's house? Is that Jake's house? And then it's like, it's the forest. That's Jake's house. I mean, we're like three miles from ASU right now, Arizona State University. It's a typical 1970s neighborhood, just typical neighborhood. And I've chosen to go green with my Very green. So, yeah. Did you like Amazing. learn everything yourself? So when I first got the house, um, I took a couple of permaculture, rainwater harvesting and gardening and ponding, like water feature pond classes. Because mm. I teach the Desert Botanical Gardens Tai Chi program. So I'm one of their teachers for like the last five years. Mm -hmm. So I got some free classes. So I was like, I'm just going to go to gardening classes. And I was pretty inspired to like harvest rainwater off my roof, um, to use wood chips, like mm -hmm. all my ground. Like, look, my, look at my ground. Like, I've, I've diverted uh, 50 landscaping truckloads. Each truckload has about five tons of wood chips. So 250 tons of wood chips I've diverted from the dump, and they've, they're here at my house making soil instead. So if you guys come over to here, this is a star fruit tree, like carambola. You guys know mm -hmm. star fruit? And if I go on top, you'll see like, like leaves and straw and wood chips. All this was free. They deliver it to me for free. And as we dig down into the mulch, as I get deeper and deeper, even though it's cold outside today, it's warmer down here. And in the summertime, it's cooler down there. And then this, is what the soil looks like that the tree's roots are growing in. Look at there's even yeah. grub wow. there. And our property is like all sand. <laughs> but if you guys start using the wood chips, it will change. So what it was yeah. sand and now it looks now it's dirt. Sand and clay. And like see see that 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 grub right there? Yeah. People think that's disgusting, but to me like a worm and a grub is life. Is life and that's what's making the ground favorable and nutritious for the fruit trees. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. 
So this is almost like, this is kind of like a natural process on steroids. Would you kind of? No, I totally agree. And yeah. I do a lot of backpacking. Like we'll go hike 40 miles, you know, several times during the summertime in Phoenix. Yeah. And I just try to reproduce what mother nature was doing out in the forest here. Mm -hmm. And mother nature doesn't use, they don't use cow manure and chicken manure. They use leaves and broken down bark and a veganic growing method. So. Amazing. Like right now we're on about two and a half feet of wood chips, which is why I built this it, wall, because it kind of holds it in. It feels yeah. spongy. It feels it's spongy, right? Spongy. Yeah. yeah. So when you plant like that tree, <clears throat> yes. okay, say, do you put the wood chips down and then dig and plant it? Or do you plant it and then you put all the wood chips around? I just planted this, this tree. It's a new avocado. And I have to rake the wood chips away, expose the native ground. Okay. Then I dig the hole, plant the tree, yeah. and then I rake it all back in. Okay. So since there was no tree there, was there like soil soil or was it sand? Just clay. So it didn't look like that mm -mm. because that looks like that because of the tree, right? It looks like, uh, just here, I'll show you what it looks like. You want to you see? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And when I first bought the property, you can see how it's raining right now and there's just puddles of water. My entire property was a mud pit every time it would rain. Oh wow. And now it's like a, you know, a spongy kind of wood chippy like and it smells like the forest yeah, yeah. it's kind of nice so the part like the reason that that one tree had soil around it was because of the tree yeah and because um the tree's roots they they create a symbiotic relationship with the mycelium and the mycorrhiza which is the microscopic organisms under the soil the roots and the mycelium they bond together and they create this life under the soil you know, roly polies, worms, they all get in there and it becomes this like underground civilization that the wood chips on top preserve. Cool. So awesome. yeah, it's a whole process. I just got a delivery of wood chips. I'm so excited. Dude, <laughs> that is life. And it's such a better use of the wood chips than the dump. Absolutely. You know? And what we're gonna do with Jake is we're going to make a salad just from your garden. We should walk around and as we walk around, we'll collect lunch. Perfect. Okay. This little citrus hedge was inspired by my friend Greg Peterson because he has a citrus hedge around his property. So I planted a, a mandarin, a grapefruit, and a tangerine here that were our little baby trees. But this is the first year at which this ruby red grapefruit has fruited. And you can see all the grapefruits, right? Yeah. There's a lot you can see, but look if I pull this skirt back. Look at how many are like underneath the skirt. There's just oh, wow. this little tiny tree. Oh, wow. Let me pull it back. This little tiny tree has easily has had over 150 grapefruits on it this year from this little tree that's just three Amazing. years old. So imagine when this tree is five years old or 10 years old, it'll be just, it'll be a food source for me for decades to come. Yeah. Amazing. So we'll pick one of these guys right now off here that has a little bit of pink on I've the never, bottom. I've never had a good grapefruit. Oh, you're gonna like this one. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, it's really good. Nice. And we'll combine it with my favorite tangerine tree here this is a clementine tangerine oh yeah so we'll pick a couple of these we'll have this too those are like my favorite and they peel so easily i'm gonna have to wash my hands because i dug in the soil with you and they're full of dirt now but the tangerines are so good and um you know the citrus is great fruit tree because it stays ripe mm -hmm. for many many months we're like apricot tree i'll get a thousand apricots in two weeks and then they're they're done mm. So we usually freeze them, but the mm. citrus will stay on for four or five months. Oh wow. It smells cool. so good out here too. Yeah. Mm. When I was a kid, we went to Florida and like my friend's grandparents like lived in an RV park or whatever, like next to a citrus farm. Okay. It's like the best. It That's just awesome. smelled like yeah. this, like all the time. Yeah. Especially when it rains. Yeah. Mm. And then, oh my God, Pam's favorite smell in the spring when it flowers. It smells like Hawaii out here. Oh yeah. Oh, man. oh really? intense. Okay, so these four trees, believe it or not, they're now four, no, they're three years and 10 months old. They'll be four years old in April. They were seeds four years ago. Wow. A seed. Whoa. And they've been this size for a year and a half. So these are Moringa. And so all of this is all edible. Every leaf is edible. And this tree, for, especially for a vegan who's interested in a plant-based protein, Moringa, I believe nowadays, is healthier than like wheatgrass juice. And it's very expensive if you buy it online. So if you can grow a Moringa tree, you've got an unlimited source of, of multivitamins and protein. There's more potassium in this leaf than bananas and more vitamin C than oranges wow. and more, more protein calorie for calorie than, than meat's got. More, um, what's it called? More calcium than milk in the Moringa. What? So we'll walk up to like the tree right here and I'll just like pull this off and put that into my smoothies 
or my salad, yeah. Yeah. or we'll dehydrate it, powder it in a in, in a Vitamix blender, and then mm -hmm. put homegrown vegan protein powder in the cupboard. Amazing. So it's pretty cool. It tastes kind of like a harsh. If you want to taste a leaf, take a green. Like the greener, the the, the better. Like these like dark these? green ones right here. Somebody sent me a ton of moringa powder, and I didn't know what to do with it. it. It's strong, so like it's also known as like a little bit of horseradish aftertaste. That much is gonna really hit you in the throat. You're gonna like. Why first, didn't you warn me? About at first, this you're gonna before. be like, I it's like really it, good. but then yeah. afterward, it kind of hits you in the throat. Okay. But if you make a tea out of it, it takes the bitterness away. If you cook mm. with it or put it in a soup or a stew, it's really good. Yeah. You like it? Yeah. Yeah. I do like it. And if you make your typical you like, put some in like, our salad? we're gonna do some in the salad <laughs> or like a soup or a stew. Add that to yeah. it. It's mm. amazing. And then all the bean pods, like these guys, when they're a bit uh, younger, just eat them like green beans. Oh, cool. So we now harvest the seeds and we sell them at jakemace.com. You can buy a little pack awesome. of seeds. So, Maybe and then what this tree also does is it creates a wonderful microclimate for hummingbirds. They like live in here all day long. And for, uh, uh, like a tree like my star fruit tree, it's got star fruits on it right now. They'll be ripe in about a month. So like this star fruit tree wouldn't survive in Phoenix unless it had the moringa creating a canopy over it to protect yeah. it in the summertime. So this tree will never freeze because in the winter the moringa is its, is its mom and the summertime the moringa is its dad. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So it helps create a top canopy for my smaller, more precious fruit trees. Awesome. Precious. And the trick you can do is people will tell you you have to get like a seed potato but all that is is just a potato from a normal grocery store is sprayed with a growth inhibitor so the eyes don't sprout out in the store. Yeah. So go to an organic store like Whole Foods and get organic potatoes. They won't be sprayed. That's what I did. I got four varieties. I did what I call, I chitted them on the counter, which is like you let them grow the eyes yeah. on the counter. I cut them all in half, planted them, and then as the stalks grow up, you add more soil, and then eventually you get the whole bed. This is a raised bed. Yeah. It's yeah. all full of potatoes. Awesome. And in between, I got this spinach called New Zealand spinach, which is um, <clears throat> kind of like a, a juicy spinach. It's got a weird taste, but we can add it to our salad. It's good to add like as a garnish on a salad. Mm. Good. And it's good. been growing for two years just on its own. It just keeps growing. So I'm in year five of my gardening project, and now what I'm noticing is that I don't have to plant much of anything anymore because the plants, there's so many of them, they reseed themselves every season, and I get just free plants. It's like printing your own money. So you don't have any way to like protect, like you don't have like fences all around this way. No. Because I planted some stuff when we first moved out there and the bunnies got everything. Oh, see everybody has their own pests. Mine are birds. But the birds don't come here because there's lots of cats. Oh. So my main guard in the back has, it's all netted from, from birds. Oh, okay. Some folks like in Scottsdale had to fight the bunnies. Mm. And they're, they're, you love bunnies till you start gardening and then you hate all bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> so this used to be my driveway and we converted half of it into this raised bed. In about a month, this will all be a new garage we're putting on the house. So this driveway now is four different raised beds that grow food. And this is all artichokes, which are kind of like a thistle. So it's very sharp, you see. Yeah. There's life everywhere. Like this is a fennel plant. So Hannah, tell me what that tastes like. Do you know what fennel tastes like? Yeah, Absolutely. I love fennel. Yeah. It's like licorice. Amazing to juice. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So that fennel's been growing for three years. I just leave the root in there and it grows for years. And the butterflies are like, this is like their nightclub. They come here every spring and I got, like people will come to my garden tours at my house and they'll be like, they'll be ducking the swarms of butterflies because they're everywhere. And then the artichokes have been here two years. The summer knocks them back and then the winter they grow again. So this will be this tall and full of easily over 50 artichokes in about two months from now. Wow. So it's like, I don't. Perennial? Yep, whatever. kind of, depending on, on your green thumb, but yeah. But this is a nice little permaculture setup with the potatoes, the New Zealand spinach, the fennel, and the artichokes, the passion vine, which is just kind of sleeping right now. These are also grapes, and then this is more potatoes here that are a month behind those ones. Passion fruit and grapes are two great choices, I think. Yeah. Like each one of these trellises that looks broken next, I'm, I'm putting the garage on so I haven't tipped it up. But that's, that's all grapes, so in about a month from now, this will be full of grapes and passion fruits. And you don't have to replant though. I don't. It will look. It will, I mean, this looks dead right now because yeah. it always does. And in the spring, it looks so green and so full of grapes. It it's in, it's insane. Mm. Every year, yeah. Yeah. Because grapes they die out in the winter, and then they come again in the spring. Mm. And passion vine is an evergreen, but it really looks a little bit beat up in the Phoenix area in the winter because mm. it's it's cold here. It's not. We're not in Kauai. Is that squash? 
Uh, this is all my bed. So this is left over from the summer. It's all eggplant and peppers. Some of them I don't get to, like this one I didn't get to. So I got overripe, so I'll just compost that in my tumbler. But if I go in here, like down here, I'll show you. Hold on, I'll grab that. Hmm. I'm gonna go into the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> if I go down, you'll find some that are still ripe, even though it's winter time. And I have purple and white varieties, and I have some peppers back here. But like, this one got overripe, so I'll compost it. But this is mainly, the eggplant is mainly a summertime crop. So I just left this here because it's trying to produce more. Like this one is a white eggplant that is getting a little bit yellow because it's getting overripe. So this is the time of year, January, where the eggplants, I dig them out and I'll plant something else here new for the spring. Okay. Which will probably be this year like uh, beans, I think. Nice. Yeah. So these were still in there even though it's winter time. Nobody grows peppers or eggplants in the winter, but if I can get them. They're still good. <laughs> nice. So right now my yard's basically the worst it can look because it's, it's winter time and I haven't pruned anything because I don't prune until a week before the spring growth happens. The reason is because I want everything that grew in the summer to stay on so that it adds a little bit of extra warmth in the winter time. So this entire area was a thriving cucumber vine and all these thorny cucumbers were my West Indian bird gherkins that are literally a little overripe now but they'll, they're still kind of there's still cucumbers on the inside. Nice. But they're really only good now for, for seeds because they're kind of a little more tough and a little more, a little mm. more sour. But when they're green, they're amazing. And now they'll just drop their seeds and they'll grow again. So in a month from now, sharp. yeah, for cooler. John Kohler talking one? about that. Mm. You could. Let me get you a good one though, hold on. It's a West Indian bird gherkin or a thorny oh. cucumber. Like in Europe, they say a gherkin for, for pickle. Yeah. It's not gonna be the best it could be though, a little sour, but mm. if you were here two months ago, it would have been amazing. Wanna try nice. it? Yeah. It's very prickly, but it's it good. Is. Is it still... I like the flavor of it. Yeah, it's still pretty good. Yeah, Give yeah. it back. I planted this 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 vine two years ago, forgot about it, and it just keeps reseeding itself. So I will clean all these vines out, it will look good again, and then it will just grow again mm. the next summer and I get I get thousands of free cucumbers every year. I can pickle them. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Awesome. Some of my so cool. My loofah vine that just keeps dropping loofah sponges. <laughs> We've already harvested most of them, but you'll see loofah still like hanging. See them all hanging off the, off of all this. Can you eat that? Yeah, so when the loofah are young, you can eat them like a zucchini. When they get this size, they're just a sponge, just a light sponge. Hmm. So we shower mm -hmm. with it, clean with it. I mean, a loofah sponge doesn't come from the ocean, it comes from a vine. <laughs> oh, wow. Just grow, People think grow your own sponge. So once you peel it, it's just underneath, it's like a sponge like that. That's a little, that one's got a little bit rotten. So this but. is what loofahs are made out of? Yeah, so let me show you. So if we get... This is what loofah... Loofah grows on a vine. <laughs> and if you got it like this, you wait until the actual loofah sponge turns brown. And then you just peel the skin off. And if this one hadn't been left outside, it would be a perfect sponge, which we have inside. Mm. And we can do dishes, we can do cleaning, or, you know, exfoliation. That's so cool. I built this water feature because having a pond is a way better use of water than a grass lawn. Oh, look at them all. And all my fish are rescues from Craigslist families who couldn't keep them anymore. Oh, that's so cute. So here, go inside here and throw them a handful of their, of their kibble. No, they'll love you. Amazing. And they'll actually still suck on your fingers when you do this. Here, I'm gonna squeeze next to you, I'll show you. If we uh... I'll throw it. Yeah, throw, throw it out there. If you throw it like down here and put your hand there, they will like just suck on your fingers like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is Tiger, he's a really cool guy. And then this is Snow and this is Lion. You know them all by name? Yeah, I named them all. I don't have kids, so this is the closest I, I get to... So you know, how many are there? A lot. I just named the koi, not the goldfish. So. Oh, okay. So this guy's <laughs> name is Avatar, and this guy's is Mickey Blue Eyes. He has blue eyes. That's hilarious. And That's that guy's awesome. my favorite. His name is Flash. He's the gold one. That's so cool. And I just put it out on Craigslist saying, hey, here's my pond. I'll save your fish. And I had families like calling me crying, saying, just rescue them. We're moving to Michigan or something. And oh. I just would wow. rescue the fish till I got about 100. Then I took the ad off of Craigslist. <laughs> and the fish are good. They're just good for... The environment? Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll drop a little tiny pump in there and I'll pump the water out once in a while and feed my trees with the fish poop water. And all the plants in the river 
So I have I have yerba manza and I have I have uh, a taro and watercress and cattails all growing, which are all edible, and they just get fed with the fish poop. And then as the water passes through those plants, those plants clean the water for the fish. So it's a yin yang yeah. symbiotic relationship for both plants and fish. Amazing. So the clarity of this water is 100% with me doing nothing. There's no chemicals, there's no chlorine, it's literally just the plants and the fish working together to make the water that clear. Huh. So this is like my tropical corner. And so what you're standing on right now, what Derek's standing on is like 100% wood chips for like three feet. Because this is like a seven foot tall wall. And I'm 6'1", so I'm looking a foot over seven foot wall, even though I'm should be a foot below it. Yeah. So we're standing on top of two and sometimes three feet of wood chips here. So Amazing. now to get into my trash alley, we're like on a step down. <laughs> so I keep adding more, more wood as we add more wood chips to keep the wood chips in the property. Amazing. That's so cool. That's and crazy. if you guys look, as you walk up there, those are papaya trees that grow because of the wood chips. <laughs> huh. <laughs> in the winter time, in January, in Phoenix, papayas are looking pretty good, like it's like it's Hawaii. Because of the wood chips. It keeps it warm in the winter Amazing. and cool in the summer. But it's like dormant season, so I feel bad that you guys aren't here when it's like going crazy. We'll come back. That's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do this an update. Like a tiger, a tiger striped panache fig. This is a black mission fig. These are my papaya mm. trees. Little papaya grove. And the papayas, this guy, believe it or not, he was a seed one year ago. What? Yep. No way. So this particular papaya tree. And it's got papayas on it. Literally the seed of this tree was planted January of 2016, a year ago. And now in one year it's gone from seed to what? Like 15 what? foot tall papaya. Yeah. What? Papayas. And these guys will just hang on until the winter passes and then they'll fruit in the spring. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. So I was really impressed with this one. <laughs> They just make it look really full back here. And, yeah. and now what's happened is that the trees themselves make this corner of my yard 15 degrees warmer than the other corner in the winter time. And in the summertime it's 15 degrees cooler. So what? the amount of plant diversity yeah. here has made this an incredible, like almost Thailand style uh, uh, wow. uh, microclimate. I pulled easily over 30 guava off this little tree this last year. I had, I had, um, I had a PBS NPR here a few months ago and we were eating guava together off the trees. This is white and this one's pink. Wow. And this one's white. So even though they're small trees, they're still producing a ton of edible fruit. Um, this one I'm really excited about. It's an ice cream bean tree grown from seed. It's about two or three years old. Mm. And if I can get this guy through the winter, I know I'll have ice cream bean, which if you guys have had before, it's like, oh my God, you should do a video on ice cream bean. The beans can get like mm. this long and this thick and you eat the white pulp mm. on the inside and it tastes like ice cream. Really? It's awesome. Yeah. So the water gets pumped from the corner to the waterfall and then it goes down the river. And oh, all wow. these plants just grow in the river using the fish fruit of I don't even do anything. It's crazy. <laughs> and all the yerba manza is like an herb that you can use for blood loss. Um, the cattails are highly edible in the, when they're young. Um, and I'm really into date palms right now, so I have like, I've planted 17 different date palms here in the last two years. How long do those take the fruit? Usually year five, so these are already in year three. Oh, okay. okay. And I have some in year five, and so this will be the first year they fruit. Wow. My main garden area, right? I would say now it's like 70% jungle, it's just like wilderness. It seeds itself, the basil is gone to seed now which is normally a summertime crop. I got all this uh, celery popping up from last season from seed. So it'll grow in yeah. the spring. And in the winter time, my leafy greens, my mint are the main source of food. So right now this is all peppermint, spearmint, chocolate mint, it's a really delicious mint. All these peppers are shishito peppers, which are a great like, like stir fry pepper. Not that spicy, just a little bit. Yeah. All of that bed is all uh, Napa mm. cabbage, which I'm gonna turn when you guys leave today. I'm gonna turn this entire bed into kimchi. Oh, cool. Because nice. that's the main ingredient, it's my Napa cabbage, yeah. so I grew all this. And then the Napa cabbage is growing with some carrots. So it's like permaculture, we got some carrots, Napa cabbage, this is purple tree collards, which Amazing. are like a perennial. And they all kind of grow together. Yeah. And then behind you guys, from my friend John Kohler, this is longevity spinach, which kind of tastes kind of like a dandelion. It's supposed to be, it's a super healthy green, like super healthy green. Mm. And it's probably really good next. It's full of water and mm -hmm. kind of dandy. That is good. Yeah. So what I've what I've found myself is since I've been gardening, 
I have been eating, you know, an infinite array of different varieties of greens and foods because I grow them. If you only go to the store, you're only gonna eat things that the, the corporate giants have chosen that look bright and ship well. And so you'll get no variety anymore. So when you grow food yourself, like how often do you see longevity spinach in, in, in the store? I've never even heard of it. Or shishito peppers, yeah. you know? Yeah. So when you garden, the power is that you can put a lot of minerals in your soil. So you're eating mineral rich food. You can eat the food in its fully ripe state and you're eating a wide variety of food that you wouldn't get otherwise. So I think if your goal is to be a vegan and grow your own food, it's an infinitely healthier way to be vegan than just mm. going to Chipotle and getting a veggie burrito, you know? Yeah. Which is good, but... Which is still fine once in a while. Every once in a while, but... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so right now, if we get... We'll pick some napkin mm. cabbage here for ourselves. That might be <clears throat> we'll, make, we'll make a salad of all this stuff. How about that? Okay, cool. I guarantee you, I guarantee you'll be the healthiest salad you've ever had because I put so oh, many I minerals guarantee. in my soil. Like, my soil is so rich. Like, it's hmm. so black and so rich full of minerals at that, I mean, like, there's worm castings, there's compost, there's over, probably over a hundred different kinds of, of minerals and trace elements in my soil, and my own compost, and coconut core, that the, food, the, the greens suck all that up. Amazing. So when you're growing, when you're buying food from the store, I mean, you're buying food that was grown in, in dust, basically. You know? Yeah. So this is a bunch of bok choy from, or th this is green mizuna from last season. I've got bok choy over here. <laughs> All this bok choy has just been growing from past seasons. You can put some mint in there too. I will. Uh, take some sprigs of mint. I still think we need to go inside to cut this out. <laughs> when I first began gardening, I'd already been vegan for like 12 years. Mm. And I didn't really trust my garden. I thought that I was gonna like contract some disease and die. Cause like I was addicted to the store, you know, and to the fridge. So yeah. I've had to rethink, rework my brain and think of this as food instead of mm. um, the fridge and the store as food. Okay. So all this stuff right here is carrots that pop up on their own. I didn't plant these. All of these guys are tomatillos, which are green tomatoes. That we can make into green salsa. Oh man. And so they're starting to die out, but they'll seed again because all the ones that are dying out will reseed the ground. Yeah. And if I go down here and I pull this out, like, you know, you just pull out, like... So you did plant those. They just started growing. So last season, I planted carrots initially. Oh. They flowered, seeded, and the seeds blew over here. Hmm. So this carrot was grown by in my own garden by itself. So everywhere you see, like, a carrot top, it's just another carrot that's being grown on its own. Wow. Everywhere. Like, this one is probably going to be a good one. Yeah, watch this. Okay, here's a good visual for you guys. So I literally planted no carrots out here in the last year. These are all just seeded by my garden. This one, you know, it's just like a big orange one. Oh wow. And they just grow everywhere. Great. I mean, is that healthy? <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's got all that dirt on it. And I know, but I believe just... that the B vitamins are in the dirt, so. Yeah. I was gonna say, it'd probably be healthier if you ate the dirt. I totally, I've been doing some research and a lot of vegans lack the B12 because they eat food that's been cleaned so so much in the store mm. that has no bioavailability on it anymore. Right. So when you just wash it off a little bit um, and don't overwash it, it's yeah. so much healthier for you, I think, nice. in my opinion. So the dill will eventually get to be about 10 feet tall by the springtime. Wow. This is all just yeah. starting to grow right now. This is Mizuna. Oh Mizuna is a really, yeah. It will get to be 10 I feet tall. That and it just grows on its own now because it, it's, it's be so the prolific. It's going to be the best salad ever. It is. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> like if I could come out here every day and make a salad, like it would be the best mm. thing ever. I only give salads my garden to special people because I don't want to waste it. So you guys are special. I feel like if you oh, put dressing you. on it though, it's just going to ruin it. We should it's like make a dressing out of like, we can, make, we can try it without a dressing. We I can make maybe. it with like orange juice, some like Let's do it. almond butter. Okay. I, I, got I can that. make a good dressing. Some garlic powder. Okay, you do the dressing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> She's the dressing master. This bed, I love it. It's all my dinosaur kale, which is my favorite kind of kale. This is called the lacinato kale or dinosaur kale, and this grows really well all through the summer even. And look at how, like, I don't spray anything and not one bug. No aphids anymore. I noticed the last two years of gardening that all my pest bugs kind of started to dissipate and go away because my soil is so healthy now compared to when I first started. When I first started, the soil was getting, was getting, it was all out of whack, you know? Did you spray yeah. it to get started? Or did you just 
No, I just, um, I kept feeding worm castings, compost, and rock dust into the soil. And yeah. the amount of different kinds of plants that I have existing together, it balances the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so when I first began gardening, I had a lot of pest bugs like squash beetles and aphids. And every year it's gotten less and less pest bugs. And now I'm growing like amazing dinosaur kale with no bugs. And I've literally, I put the seeds in the ground and then four months later it's this and there's no spray, there's nothing. I don't, I don't, I don't fertilize or anything. Wow. Which one? This is all, all beets and Swiss chard. So if we go over here and we pull out like this leaf is like a chard. Hmm. This tastes a little piece of that. Tastes a, little, tastes a little piece of that. It'll be kind of salty. It's got like a salty taste, the, the Swiss chard does. What do you think? Mm. Yeah, you can taste it. Mm. That's why I tell people, like, if you miss salt, then eat more greens, because greens are really salty. And those are the beet greens, yeah. which we eat like a, yeah. just like a spinach. All right, and I think we've got probably 30, 40 minutes of footage. So we're gonna go in, we're gonna enjoy an awesome salad from Jake and Pam's garden here. And if you want to check out more videos about this, um, about longevity gardens, I'll link Jake's uh, channel down below and then you can uh, start learning about how he's created this incredible garden oasis in the middle of Phoenix. Awesome. Thanks so much for watching guys. I'll catch you on the next video and talk to you soon. Peace.